distinguished speaker this evening, uh, Andrew Bradstock. Andrew is Emeritus Professor at the University of Winchester in the UK. He's previously had teaching appointments in the United Kingdom at La Saint Union College in Southampton and also at uh, Winchester, a college of higher education, what is now the University of Winchester, where he's an Emeritus Professor. But of course, he's well known in this part of the world for the time he spent here between 2009 and 2013 as the founding professor and director of the Centre for Theology and Public Issues and Howard Paston Professor of Theology and Public Issues. It's absolutely wonderful to be welcoming him back this evening. He's going to be talking to us about his recent book on Bishop David Shepherd. This evening is actually first of a two-part sequence. This evening he's going to be focusing on David Shepherd in terms of public theology and then on Thursday he'll be speaking on David Shepherd as the cricketer. Andrew, when you're ready, over to you. Well, thank you very much, David, and um, good evening to all friends who've um, linked in. Of course, it's morning here, 8.30 in the morning, just had my breakfast, um, and sunlight streaming in, as you can see. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's a great honour to be invited to take part in, in this series and to reconnect with the department where I spent, as David's just said, nearly five very happy years. It's quite sobering to think that it's um, now more than six years since uh, Helen and I returned to the UK. And in fact, we've now been back in the UK a bit longer than we were in Dunedin. Um, and we haven't been back. We did come very close to coming back in 2016 when Helen uh, was awarded her PhD, which she started in the department at Otago. But uh, sadly, her father was um, not at all well at that time and it didn't seem right to be away on the other side of the world for several weeks. Um, because we, some of you who knew me will know that we came back perhaps a bit prematurely in 2013 for both life and death reasons, actually. Um, the happy reasons were that Helen's daughter was told us she was going to produce our first grandchild in um, October. And so we now have a lovely six-year-old granddaughter and uh, uh, she has a younger brother. Um, but the sadder news was that her father had a terminal prognosis for his cancer and uh, he sadly died in July 2017, but we were able to have nearly uh, four years with him before that. Anyway, as I say, it's great to be um, back in touch again, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to share in this session, and again, the session on Thursday. I'm aware that um, David Shepherd may be an unfamiliar name to some, perhaps, I don't know, perhaps most of you, I guess if we were in the room together, I might uh, ask for a show of hands if anybody had, had heard of him. Let me assume that um, he's not a familiar figure and perhaps just give you a tiny bit of background and then say why I think that his life and ministry uh, should be of interest to us this evening. Um, oh, now, I'm just going to... Oh, I want to move the PowerPoint on. Um, Oh, it's not working. Oh, um, oh dear. Um, Looks like you're I, getting it. Just, just bear with it. I uh, did a practice, need... actually. I did a practice of this to make sure this wouldn't happen. Um, it's not, it's not moving on. Um, uh, hmm. I don't know quite what other buttons to press here now. Um, Oh, I'm so sorry about this. I've got this whole PowerPoint here. Um, ah, there we are. It did it. Right. Okay, maybe um, <laughs> maybe I should do it slightly ahead of time. It's obviously taken a couple of minutes <laughs> to come through. Um, uh, right, so um, as, as David said, I'm giving a talk about David Shepherd, the cricketer, later on this week, but he first actually shot to fame in the 1950s as a, as a cricketer. Um, he played 22 times for England, uh, captained them a couple of times. Here he is coming out to bat with the legendary uh, Len Hutton. Um, he actually came to New Zealand uh, twice with the MCC 
and um, played twice at Carisbrook actually on those tours. But anyway, I'll say more about that on uh, Thursday, including his um, role in the, his very high profile role actually in the campaign for a sporting boycott of apartheid South Africa. And he's second from left in this photo here. This is a march to Twickenham uh, during the Springbok rugby tour of 1969. Anyway, more of that on, on Thursday. I have to say it's slightly artificial to divide up his life like this into the cricket and, and the church because um, he saw his life very much as an integrated life, really, between the sporting and the church careers. And, uh, and his Christian faith affected both. And in fact, many of the skills that he deployed as a bishop, um, he developed while in cricket. So skills like um, leadership and team building and handling the media and developing his powers of concentration and particularly um, application and determination to succeed were all honed really on the cricket pitch and then put into effective practice as a, as a bishop. He once said that he wasn't a ready-made cricketer or a bishop, he had to put enormous effort into learning the craft in, in both cases. But um, it's in his capacity as a bishop that I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about him this evening. And uh, in the 1980s, he was probably the most high profile Church of England bishop at a time when the church itself, almost uniquely under um, Archbishop Robert Runcie, had an unusually high profile, mainly on account of its disenchantment, to say the least, with the policies of the government led by the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. And in fact, there was so much tension developed during the 1980s between the Church of England and the uh, government that uh, towards the end of the decade, the church became known really as um, de facto the Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Um, but, uh, but more of that anon. I also probably need to fill you in on his rather less than obvious transition from being an international cricketer uh, to a church leader. Not many people have actually taken that journey. Um, in, in brief, while he was a student at Cambridge, um, he had a dramatic conversion to Christ. He went uh, rather against his will to a Christian Union evangelistic rally in Great St. Mary's uh, Church, Great Mary's Church, the, um, the uh, student church in Cambridge. He always thought till then that he was on the path to God. And if he just kept on it and did a bit, worked a bit harder, he would um, be all right. But the preacher that evening emphasized the need of, um, as he put it, a personal relationship with Christ. And it was by responding to this that evening that um, all Shepherd's priorities really changed. I mean, there were many, many consequences of that evening, and you can't really understand his life without realizing what he went through at that time. But, um, but it really uh, transformed all his priorities. And if he thought in terms, as I think he did, of a full career in first class cricket, he now felt he had to consider what God wanted him to do rather than what, uh, what he wanted to do himself. And this led him eventually to step back from cricket, not give it up altogether, but to, as, as you will discover on Thursday, but to step back from it really at the height of his fame. I mean, um, he, he really was on the verge of an even more glittering career in cricket than he had at that time. And he was led to stand back from cricket and to pursue the life of a priest. And it was as a priest that he felt a calling to work uh, really essentially, I think, as a missionary in the inner city. Here he is uh, with a boys club in um, North London that he set up in the 1950s. Uh, I mean, it's interesting because he came from a comfortable middle class family, but um, he really got converted to working in poor inner city areas while he was a curate in North London. And in fact, it was such a profound thing that he called it his second conversion. And he felt a deep concern that the church was ignoring the inner city, despite the gospel's call to bring good news to the poor. And despite city areas being where most people lived, he felt the church was ignoring it. And he became really something of a pioneer in the um, 50s, 60s and 70s in terms of um, bringing the church into contact with the inner city. He was also, I think, a pioneer in his day, certainly unusual, in being an evangelical with a strong commitment to social justice. I mean, now I think it's taken for granted that um, 
evangelicalism and social justice go together. It certainly wasn't in the um, 50s and 60s. And throughout his life, he saw himself, as he would describe it, called to be a not only but also Christian. In other words, passionate that the gospel could change people individually and give them a new start, but convinced also that it had something to say about the conditions in which people lived and the extent to which their communities were or weren't built on just principles. So that really sums up his, um, his approach. And out of that came, um, out of his experience of working in the city, came two books in particular, which um, some of you might know, uh, Built as a City, which came out in 1974, and Bias to the Poor, which came out in 1983. Both sold um, very, very well, actually. Um, he was also responsible for the uh, Faith in the City report, which came out in 1985, and I'll come back to that later. Well, look, that, that's really all I need to say about his life as such, I think. I mean, it's an interesting and action-packed life. Um, and if you're interested in knowing more about it, here comes the commercial plug. Uh, let's get that out the way first as well. Um, as David said, I've spent the last, I suppose, four years really researching David Shepherd's biography, and it came out uh, just before Christmas, the late, late November. It's based on a lot of um, new research, a couple of hundred interviews, and it's the authorised biography in the sense that I had the blessing of his family and access to his private papers, which are closed to, to general uh, access. Um, although it's authorised, it's not uncritical, and I do look at the cost that particularly his um, family had to bear uh, uh, behind the scenes, if you like, and there's a few other critical comments in there. So it's not exactly, um, it's, it, being authorised doesn't mean it's actually wholeheartedly approved uh, by, <laughs> by the family. Um, and it's been, um, uh, sorry, there's the launch event in the House of Lords. Some of you might recognise Mike Brearley, the former England captain who was one of the hosts. The gentleman on the left with the poppy is uh, Brian Griffiths, who was actually an advisor to Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s. I'll come back to him later. Extraordinary, really, a staunch conservative, but he actually was very close to a friend of Shepherd's and a great supporter and admirer of Shepherd and a great supporter of the book as well, actually. Um, so that says something uh, which we'll come back to. And um, it's been <laughs> selling extraordinarily well, actually. I'm quite surprised. There it is in second place in the Amazon list of best <laughs> best-selling cricket biographies behind someone called Ben Stokes, um, who I think is probably New Zealand's favourite export at the moment. <laughs> but uh, it was one thing to get in the Church Times top 10, but I thought it was quite, quite extraordinary to get into the um, in the top 10 of best-selling cricket biography, especially as it's hardly a mainstream cricket biography and I'm hardly a cricket writer. But anyway, enough of this, enough of this. Let's get on. Um, yeah, so as I got into his, his life, I mean, I always thought he was an interesting person, but the more I got into his life and thinking, the more I realised that he was a concrete example of what has now become known as public theology. It wouldn't have been a familiar term to him. By public theology, I mean, um, and this is the definition really that I worked with uh, when I was at Otago, um, the practice of drawing upon the insights of the Christian faith to bring a theological perspective to bear upon contemporary debates and issues in the public square. Um, really to make a positive difference to the real world, to, to make a difference to the lives of individuals, communities and society at large. And I think public theology is not just about the church sort of doing politics or doing social justice or making statements and things. It's actually consciously using the resources of the Christian faith to inspire action, to promote the common good and uh, that's what I want to, to share with you a bit this evening in the hope that it will um, be of interest and perhaps even inspiration. I mean there's a lot in print about the theory if you like of public theology and I confess to having contributed to that myself but this is um, a story of it actually being put into practice even if as I say the term public theology wouldn't have been familiar to David Shepherd himself. And I'm going to look at Shepherd as an exemplar of public theology from two angles. Firstly, in terms of his work in Liverpool, where he was bishop for 22 years, from 1975 until his retirement in 1997. 
And secondly, on the national stage here in UK, in the UK, he had really um, twin ministry, but as a bishop in a diocese of Liverpool and, uh, and as a nationally known figure. So first, uh, Liverpool, which, I mean, when he arrived in 1975, was a city in very, very deep trouble. Um, just to list some of the problems in, in Liverpool, um, a massive, massive unemployment, the docks, which had sustained its economy and provided employment for many decades, was no longer needed for a variety of reasons, which I won't go into now. Factories were closing at an alarming rate. The um, employment fell between 1971 and 1985 by 33%, which is an extraordinary rate. The national average was 3% in the UK. So Liverpool, as one expert said at the time, was on its way to becoming the first de-industrialised city in, in the UK. Um, secondly, there was um, ongoing social unrest, ongoing tension between the uh, black community in Liverpool and the police which spilled over into uh, violence several times in the 1980s, most famously in the part of inner city known as Toxteth, um, the so-called Toxteth riots. Um, thirdly, it had pretty dysfunctional local politics. Liverpool became notorious in the 1980s for its local council becoming dominated by the militant tendency, uh, which was a self-confessed Trotskyite movement which worked within the Labour Party. And uh, the council pursued a policy in the mid 1980s of massive urban regeneration, which was fine in itself, of course, but um, they refused to increase the local rate to fund it, which put them increasingly at loggerheads with Margaret Thatcher's government and brought the city pretty much to near bankruptcy in 1985. And then fourthly, but by no means least, if not, in fact, if perhaps most importantly, there was a deep and uh, long-standing sectarianism in Liverpool. Not for nothing was it known sometimes as the, the Belfast of the mainland. Deep-rooted hostility between the city's Protestant and Roman Catholic communities, going back really to the early 1800s. Um, people grew up in their separate areas of the city having very little contact with each other. And there used to be marches on key dates like St. Patrick's Day and the 12th of July when Protestants celebrate the Battle of the Boyne, which would often end in, uh, in violence. Now, when Shepherd went to Liverpool in 1975, he was well aware of all this. And in fact, the point is he went with a deliberate agenda to address these issues. And in forming his approach to these issues, where I think a number of deeply held convictions that had grown in his thinking uh, in, in the years before. Firstly, he had a um, profound dislike of unemployment. And, and poverty, which he believed took away a person's dignity and were a threat to family life. But he went further than that and argued, uh, secondly, that unemployment and poverty damaged communities. Now, um, government ministers at the time regularly appealed to unemployed people to move out of areas where there was high unemployment, like Liverpool, and uh, move to areas where work was more plentiful. But Shepherd argued against that and said that when that happened, when people did leave their communities, the communities they left suffered. He often spoke of the left behind, left behind in communities in a downward spiral because all the ambitious and more able people had left. It was much better, he thought, to encourage people to stay and then provide incentives for them to stay, training opportunities, and other measures, measures which would attract inward investment and business and create jobs. <coughs> he often drew on, um, this is, I think this is his favorite verse. It appears in so many of his writings and speeches and sermons. Paul's reference to the body in Romans 12. And he used this in support of his advocacy of the importance of building and maintaining community. We who are many are one body in Christ and individually we are members one of another. And that phrase, members one of another, comes up time and again. Now, of course, Paul is clearly speaking to and about the church, but Shepherd thought the principle could be applied to wider society. It challenged people, he thought, to place the well-being of others over self-interest, to want the best 
for your neighbor as well as for yourself. Um, and this was the essence, he thought, of uh, the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. He used to say the desire inside a Christian must be about the common good. It must be about enabling everybody to flourish, everybody to enjoy the life in all its fullness that Jesus came to announce. He talked of the incarnation as Jesus becoming poor for the sake of humanity. And he would say the cross was the supreme symbol of self-sacrifice, standing for, quote, the exact opposite of the free for all smash and grab approach to life. It is why the demands of the individual have to be measured within the good of society as a whole. And that thinking based on that passage in Romans very much informed his ministry in Liverpool and indeed more widely. So that was uh, his conviction about community. We'll come back to that in a bit. Um, thirdly, he also thought the gospel was about building bridges and promoting reconciliation. This is another of his favorite um, verses, 2 Corinthians 5. Um, it, the gospel was about promoting reconciliation between estranged groups and communities, just as God had done with humanity in Christ. And for Shepherd, it was important when there were differences and divisions to get people around the table to discuss issues and find ways to move forward together not by playing down or glossing over the differences, but discussing them openly and understanding each other's positions. And that very much informed his approach. And I'll come back to one or two examples of that in a bit. And fourthly, um, he had a profound commitment to ecumenism. This is a march to launch a Churches Together initiative in Liverpool in, in the 1980s. You can see him in the middle uh, on his left is the Roman Catholic Archbishop Derek Warlock, who I'll come back to. There's also Baptist, Salvation Army, Methodist, Presbyterian, United Reformed Church leaders there. Um, and, um, and then there's the two cathedrals, the Anglican Cathedral, bottom left, and the Catholic Cathedral in Liverpool, top right. Um, he, he, as I say, a profound commitment to, to working ecumenically, to finding ways of working together with other Christians. And again, this was not about ignoring points of conflict between churches or wanting to water them down, but about getting to know one another in order to argue, as he once put it, without slamming the door and living apart in our denominations. And then finally, um, although I'm sure I'm not exhausting his list of convictions, but he, he certainly had a conviction that the church should not be an armchair critic of society, observing from the stands but it should be on the pitch, playing a part in improving things, reflecting God's own bias to the poor. And this was rooted in his understanding of the kingdom of God, which was not only about individual conversion, but also about, as he put it, lifting up one's horizons to what God wants the world to be like. He once said, God loves things like mercy, justice, and truth, and hates things like greed and oppression. And he would often, revert back to the concept of justice as he understood it in the Hebrew scriptures, Zedek, which he said was not the same as fairness, as though everyone started from the same line. Zedek topples over on behalf of those in direst need. This bias to the poor informed his, um, very much informed his ministry, very much at the heart of his approach. So that I think is what drove him as he went to, to Liverpool. Uh, but how did he translate these convictions? Well, let me give you one or two examples of practical, as I say, practical public theology, practical implementation of these convictions. Well, in terms of the unemployment in Liverpool, he, he worked tirelessly across those 20 years to encourage new companies, new businesses to, to come to Liverpool and also encourage existing ones to stay because there was often a temptation to leave and find um, more fruitful parts of the country to settle your business in. Um, it was a hugely challenging task to attract business to Liverpool because um, for the reasons that I've just explained really, it had a terrible reputation. It was by no means the obvious place that a business would look to set up. And, and so it often, you know, it put off, those reasons put off investment. And indeed, after the Tox death, 
incidents in the early 1980s, the government talked about leaving Liverpool to a managed decline. And um, yeah, that's how serious it had become. But um, Shepard would constantly uh, challenge this and seek to rebut government appeals to people to, uh, to get on their bike and look for work. Um, the top right photo is Norman Tebbit, uh, who famously said that it's no good protesting about unemployment. You should do what my father did in the war when there was no work, got on his bike and looked for work. And that was very much a mantra in, in the government circles, get, get out of places of high unemployment and go to move to places where there are jobs. Um, and the bottom left, the minister there is Michael Heseltine, who um, Shepard developed a good relationship with and had a lot of time for. And Heseltine uh, was perhaps the leading figure in the Conservative government in terms of in taking up the idea that perhaps Liverpool should be revived and business should reinvest in Liverpool. But as I say, Shepard would regularly challenge this idea that um, people should leave. It's interesting in passing, um, there's a peculiarly sort of English way of doing public theology that um, David Shepard <laughs> exemplifies. In terms, he had uh, frequent contact with government ministers. Um, but it, it strike, struck me and it struck a lot of others that um, he had an advantage over many other church leaders at the time in the UK. Um, firstly, because he was a Church of England bishop and because we have the established church which has um, a higher status, if you like, and, and more ready access to the corridors of power than other churches. But also Shepherd himself had the sort of background that made it easy for him to relate to government ministers. He went to a good public school, he went to Cambridge, he spoke the language of many of the ministers that he knew. And, um, and so he did have quite good uh, avenues into the corridors of power. And it also struck me researching him that um, any of those who were interested in cricket, any government ministers would, would probably have seen him as a bit of a boy's hero, really. They would have wanted to meet him just as a, as a cricketer. And they would sometimes bump into him actually at <laughs> cricket matches. I found a wonderful letter that uh, David Shepherd wrote to John Major, the prime minister in 1981, where he says, um, do you remember that wet afternoon at Trent Bridge? We sat talking about Liverpool. And, um, and, he's, and then he sort of says, you know, you said I could come in and see you sometime, talk about this. This is the kind of ready access that he had uh, to the corridors of power, which I think made it a bit easier in, in some ways. But the interesting thing, of course, is that he used his privileged status and background not to further his own ends, but actually to speak on behalf of those whose voices were generally ignored. Uh, I think he's a sort of living example of Proverbs 31, really, speaking for those who cannot speak. And one very practical and effective measure that he and his Roman Catholic counterpart, Derek Warlock, initiated was a regular meeting of local business leaders. This was called the Michaelmas Group after the time of year when they first met. And this was not really about initiating projects, but helping to enable projects designed to improve the economic, commercial and social prosperity of the region to be brought to a successful outcome. So it was a sort of Chatham House Raw meeting for business leaders to talk about how to improve the economic uh, well-being of the region. And one benefit of this was that when Shepherd uh, and Warlock sometimes went to see government ministers, they were well briefed because they'd been talking to local business leaders. And also ministers talking to them would realise that they weren't just talking from a faith perspective, but actually on behalf of the wider community. And there are examples of some quite striking success that they had as they went to uh, defend Liverpool's case, if you like, with government ministers. So that was uh, one major plank, I think, of Shepherd's ministry in Liverpool. Um, secondly, in terms of reconciliation, working to build bridges, there are many examples of that. Um, during the years of militant dominance of the local council, communications virtually broke down between the local government and central government. And uh, Shepherd sort of stepped in and maintained channels of communication between local and central government, often working behind the scenes. I found a number of letters about all that, which um, perhaps were not widely known before. Similarly, in industrial disputes, when uh, talks broke down between unions and management, he would work hard to keep negotiations alive, talk to both sides, try and bring them round the table when everything else seems to have failed. 
And after Toxteth, well, I mean, he and other church leaders played a hugely important role in seeking to calm things down. They would walk around the streets, they would talk to the community, they would talk to the police, they would try and mediate between the two when of course there was hardly any contact. Um, and probably they were the only people really in the community who could do that. And they saw that that was the fact and they had the courage to do it. And Shepherd, as I've hinted earlier, would really make a point of talking and listening to both sides. So he supported a community initiative to help people visit family members who'd been arrested. But he also visited the police to try and understand their perspective and hear their concerns. And one practical outcome that he was involved with was the establishment of a law centre. And here he is with Derek Warlock uh, at the law centre. And this aimed to provide legal advice and services to the local community and try and improve their contact with the police. Shepherd virtually raised all the money for this uh, from trusts and charities and worked hard to promote it to the Home Office and local leaders and the police. Um, and thirdly, and I, I suppose probably in the long term, the perhaps most significant thing he did was building his relationship with Derek Warlock, the Archbishop, the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Liverpool, which I've already mentioned, which has often been referred to as the Mersey miracle. Um, can't go into this in detail, there's masses of, of stuff about this one could say, but um, the important thing is that right from the start, uh, Shepherd and Warlock set out to work together their default position was to do everything together and to be seen to be doing so. The book they're holding is one of the uh, three books they wrote together called Better Together, which about just about sums up their approach, actually. Uh, they garnered huge media coverage in Liverpool for what they were doing, and they did that quite deliberately. I mean, they weren't sort of the first leaders from different traditions to work together, but what made their relationship unique was its intentionally public nature. They, by taking opportunities to be seen together, they consciously work to bridge the divide, which as I said was very deep and very long-standing between their traditions. Again, a very risky and courageous undertaking when you think of the history and the context. I mean, the troubles in Northern Ireland, just across the Irish Sea, were, were still continuing in the 1980s. Um, there was ongoing sectarian sympathies in, in the northwest of England. Um, it was quite a troubled time. It provided a very worrying backdrop. They themselves were often accused of treachery by more dogmatic members of their respective churches. And it didn't take much to, to spark a protest. And um, not least in the build up to the visit of Pope John Paul II in 1982, um, there were a number of protests uh, leading up to that. But really, this was an extraordinary. Uh, moment, an extraordinary achievement in terms of ecumenical activity. The Pope spent some time in the Anglican Cathedral, something that I guess in previous generations would have been considered unthinkable. Um, and so I, I'm just trying to say, I think by patient sort of example and conscious effort, Shepherd and Warlock um, brought the remaining barriers between their communities down and actually made the idea of churches working together as a sort of new normal. They, they gave uh, permission really by their actions for ecumenical ventures to be tried at a local level. And as a consequence, made it harder for those on the extremes in their traditions to, to gain a foothold. And it's a measure of their achievement that I think after nearly two centuries of bitter sectarian division in the city, they could say towards the end of their time that the people in Liverpool have come to expect the churches to act together. They left a number of uh, ecumenical legacies. Probably the best known is Liverpool Hope University, which is still Europe's only ecumenical university. And they played a huge part in creating that. They also worked ecumenically, as I suggested earlier, with the free churches. Um, I, won't, I won't go into that at the moment. I think overall that Shepherd and Warlock's contribution to Liverpool was unique and in terms of impact, quite extraordinary. During the course of my research, I spoke to a number of people in key roles in the city who remembered them. People in business, in the media, in local government, in the church, in culture, in sport. And they all affirmed that the bishops made a huge difference to the fortunes of the city, changing its image to attract investment. I mean, if you go to Liverpool now, you wouldn't recognise it in terms of the earlier photographs. It's an extraordinarily vibrant uh, city 
has been completely transformed, not single-handedly by the bishops by any means, but they played a hugely influential role in turning the fortunes of the city around, <clears throat> changing its image to attract investment, healing communities which have been ex ex estranged for centuries. I mean, I haven't got time really to mention the role they played following the tragedy of Hillsborough, for example, when 96 Liverpool fans died uh, at a football match. They played a huge role in comforting families and seeking to bring the city through that awful, absolutely awful time, and the Heisel Stadium event as well. They were both in the 1980s. They also provide the sort of healing balm as well around Toxteth and promoting the interests of the community, particularly, of course, its poorest members. One influential figure in Liverpool I spoke to suggested that the bishops helped to give the city the confidence to apply to become European City of Culture. And they did apply in 1997 to become European City of Culture, which, as I say, would have been absolutely unthinkable 20 years before. And they were actually uh, awarded that status in 2008. I think in many cities, the, the person in the street would be hard pressed even to name their bishop. Perhaps some wouldn't even know they had a bishop. Um, yet people in Liverpool not only knew Shepherd and Warlock, but saw them as defenders of their interest. Not many cities have statues of their bishops in public place, but this is the ma a main thoroughfare, Hope Street in Liverpool, there's a statue of both bishops, which was commissioned by a local newspaper and paid for by public subscription, which gives some indication of the affection with which they were held in their adopted city. Um, you know, we could do a whole lecture on the symbolism of this, the fact they're not up on a plinth, but they're approachable. If you look through there, you see the Anglican Cathedral. And if you go and stand the other side and look through, you see the Metropolitan Cathedral, the Roman Catholic Cathedral. And there's all sorts of other imagery and um, <clears throat> messages on carved into that statue. But, um, oh, and there's a lovely touch. If you look at the bottom of Shepherd's uh, statue, there's a cricket ball down the bottom there. <laughs> um, but I think that symbolizes the, um, you know, their contribution and their affection that they were held in. <clears throat> now, just briefly, um, to go on to the national stage, um, where Shepherd also sought to influence public thinking and, and policy formation in a number of ways. Don't forget, as I say, he had a high profile already through Liverpool. He had access, ready access to government ministers. He was an established church bishop. He had a seat in the House of Lords. Um, again, that's something else we could talk about, but um, bishops sit, 26 bishops sit automatically in the second chamber in Westminster and therefore have an opportunity to speak and help to influence uh, public thinking. Now, as I say, trying to influence public thinking and policy thinking in the era of Margaret Thatcher was a huge challenge because, um, well, uh, his views on the importance of community and people's independence, interdependence, people's interdependence and responsibilities one to another were actually at wide variance, really, with those of the prevailing orthodoxy. As I said earlier, Shepherd took the line that um, the Christian model of society is that of a body. If one organ suffers, then all organs suffer. If one flourishes, then all flourish. A community's responsibility is to look after its weakest members, which he thought was a strongly biblical idea. Um, government ministers who sought to engage theologically, and, and there were some, including Margaret Thatcher herself, of course, um, as, a, as a practicing Christian, um, would argue that Christian ethics are primarily about personal responsibility, about helping others through charity. But Shepherd thought that this set up a false opposition by pitting this against the role for the state. And he once said, we strongly believe and preach the personal responsibility of individuals. At the same time, we emphasize that New Testament Christianity is not about individuals standing on their own two feet. It is also about being members one of another, about bearing one another's burdens. I mean, he thought that charity and the voluntary sector were important, but in terms of carrying the main load of caring for the neediest, this should be the whole community's responsibility. He said it was an earnest of the community's acceptance that its weakest members are valued and not judged. And um, perhaps he's a bit of his time here, but he thought that taxation was a great example of belonging to one body. And it was better than charitable giving. Taxation was indiscriminate, whereas charity 
was dictated by preferences and prejudices, he said. The interesting thing, of course, is that Shepard's view was not a maverick one. He wasn't a one-off or an um, outlier. It was actually shared by many of his fellow bishops and was a major cause, a cause of tension throughout the 1980s, as I said earlier. So there was hardly a ready reception in government circles when he raised concerns or when he produced reports highlighting what he saw as injustices which required remedial action. Now, again, we don't have time to go into any of this in, in detail, um, but it's probably worth mentioning the, the best example of this tension, which was the Faith in the City report, which was published in November 1985. Shepard was involved in this right from the start and was really its principal driver. Its terms of reference were to examine the strength and as a result, to reflect on the challenge which God may be making to church and nation and to make recommendations to appropriate bodies. So it was basically an examination of the situation in the UK's urban priority areas. In other words, it's inner city areas and outer housing estates. And to cut to the chase, it produced a devastating report. Um, it summed up its findings in um, four headings really. It said we've discovered poverty. Uh, people aren't starving as they are in the developing world but many residents of urban priority areas are deprived of what the rest of society regard as the essential minimum for a decent life. Poverty was at the root of powerlessness. Poor people lack the means and opportunity of making choices in their lives. Um, there was uh, inequality in society greater than most people would deem acceptable and polarization with the impoverished minority becoming increasingly cut off from mainstream life. And they summed up really the message of the plain message of their observations. The nation is confronted by a grave and fundamental injustice in the, in the cities. The situation continues to deteriorate and requires urgent action, but no adequate response is being made by government, nature, nation or church. Um, I mean, it was a report to the church as well as to the nation, but uh, obviously, it, it was uh, critical of the government. In fact, it went deeper uh, and spoke of the right of the national church to act as the conscience of the nation. And this is a quote from the report. It's the right of the national church to question all economic philosophies, not least those which, when put into practice, have contributed to the blighting of whole districts which do not offer the hope of amelioration and which perpetuate human misery and despair. Now, um, I can't go into a lot of detail here, but um, suffice it to say that the government did not exactly welcome the report with open arms. Having been in power by then six years, more than six years, they took it as a direct criticism of their policies and indeed initially sought to rubbish its findings. And Mrs Thatcher's chief economic advisor, Brian Griffiths, who we saw in that early photo at the launch of the book, um, wrote a briefing to her uh, in which he said that running through faith in the city is a deep hostility to government policy and the philosophy on which it is based. Uh, one political commentator in, in the Times described the faith in city report as in many ways the high watermark of systematic criticism of the government's policies by the Church of England. Just briefly, in terms of this as an example of, of effective public theology, um, well, first of all, it filled a gap. Um, perhaps the church was in a unique position to make this kind of report, uh, to fill this kind of gap. Um, perhaps there was no one, it was free of sort of, uh, you know, the bias that you would expect in a political party, for example, or the single issue of a charity. Um, so perhaps it was stepping in, into a breach there and uh, filling a need. Um, secondly, it was based on very sound research. The, the commission worked for two and a half years. They visited more than 30 cities and nine inner London boroughs and amassed a wealth of evidence. Its chairman, um, Sir Richard O'Brien, who was in that earlier photograph, was a highly respected figure with high level experience in work creation initiatives, um, had a strong commitment to ensuring the port report couldn't be criticized on a factual level. It was also theologically informed. I mean, it's been open to criticism on this level, but it did attempt to show 
how the God who became incarnate in Jesus has a deep concern for and is indeed present among the inner cities and their people and how the gospel has the power to transform the lives of individuals, families and communities. And then finally, it actually made a difference. Um, despite the government's initial hostility to the report and its findings, it did in fact provoke it into remedial action with respect to the cities. And I had a long conversation, well, I had several conversations with uh, Lord Griffiths, Brian Griffiths, who was Margaret Thatcher's chief economic advisor. And he told me that the report was a huge spur to the government. I mean, it wasn't known at the time, but it was a huge spur to the government to do more on urban issues. Naturally, the government didn't follow the specific policies and recommendations in the report um, because they, they, they were on a different ideological plane. But, um, but in terms of provoking it to a response, it was very profound. And in fact, when you look at the Conservative Party manifesto for the next election, which was 1987, exactly bears this out with its commitment to tackle regeneration of the inner cities and policies to address housing, jobs, social security, and local government. So um, I think that is a piece of effective uh, public theology. Just quickly, it's interesting to contrast this with another major report which Shepherd was to drive 10 years later. This one focused on unemployment and the future of work and was also based on detailed research over two years. And this one fed into the general election of May 1997. But unlike Faith in the City, it received a very warm welcome from the incoming government of uh, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, particularly insofar as it spoke of the possibility of full employment and the provision of good, enough good work for everyone. There's no evidence uh, that Labour politicians influenced the report, but there were marked similarities in the report between, uh, between some of the report's conclusions and the New Deal policy introduced by New Labour within a year of taking office. And for the first few years of the Labour government of 97, there was a honeymoon period when the relationship between the churches and the government was close in marked contrast to the Thatcher and major years, with the new Labour government seeing the churches as allies in their quest for full employment. So here's an example of David Shepherd being influential through cooperation rather than perhaps um, opposition. So uh, to conclude, I would say that um, Shepherd had a unique role both in his diocese and on the national stage with a particular focus on seeing people in the inner city flourish. A good place to end might be his memorial in Liverpool Cathedral, which if you ever visit, I would recommend you go and find. Uh, here's Desmond Tutu uh, at the memorial. This features, um, a white Portland stone, as you can see, set into a crater, carved directly into the sandstone wall, signifying the lasting effect that Shepherd made on the city. And around it, it's not that clear, but there's um, a verse from scripture which expresses what Shepherd sought to do in the place to which God had called him. Jeremiah 29, 7, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you and pray to the Lord on its behalf which I think is a fitting epitaph. Thank you. Andrew, thank you. This has been a wonderful overview of David Shepherd's life and ministry and exploration of key aspects of his effective <laughs> theology. Thank you so much. We will at this point end the recording and